Hello everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events, and this is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. Go there, click on this link, and you'll see all the events we have in our pipeline. Then, if whatever for whatever reason you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, do it now, and this way you'll get notified about all our new videos and of course join our amazing community and if you do not know we have we are planning an amazing course about mlops mlops zoom camp it's a free course about mlops um, you can check the link in the description as well so go there click if you like it uh, register there we are starting in a couple of weeks during today's interview you can ask any question you want there is a, a pinned link in the live chat click on this link ask your question and I will be covering these questions during the interview. So I think that's all from me. So I will stop sharing my screen. And I will now try to get the notes I prepared. Okay, I have the notes. Are you ready, Jeff? Sure. Okay. So hmm, this week we'll talk about teaching data engineers. And we have a special guest today, Jeff. Jeff has been teaching for quite some time. So first uh, he was teaching data scientists and data engineers. He will probably tell us more about that. So welcome, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, so before we go into our main topic of teaching data engineers and teaching in general, let's start with your background. I know you have an amazing background, but probably it's better if you tell us uh, about that. So can you tell us about your career journey so far? Sure. Um... So yeah, I started uh, as a lawyer and I, I went to law school. Um, and in my last semester of law school, I joined a tech startup. Um, and I was doing, you know, like strategy for them, basically helping them expand uh, their product and their, their offering. Um, and what I saw was just, I started getting a lot of the questions that I wanted to answer and a lot of the work that I wanted to do just involved code. You know, if we wanted to know what regions to move into, uh, who our salespeople were that were the best, you know, like I, we had to answer those questions with SQL and things like that. So that's when I started coding. Um, and then I joined a law firm because I had to, you know, pay off my student loans. But while I was there, I knew that I wanted to move into uh, web development and learning how to code. Uh, so I did a general assembly for three months. I uh, was lucky enough to get hired by an awesome tech company, um, really learned on the job uh, for a couple of years. And after I felt pretty good about being a developer and, you know, like I could, you know, like I was really a contributor to the team uh, for a little while, then I, I kind of, I found myself actually reading a book on how to be a better teacher, which was weird because I never taught at that point before. Um, and I was like halfway through the book and I just knew that education was a passion of mine. So I looked to see if Flatiron School was hiring anyone. Um, they were. They were looking for a new lead instructor. Uh, I applied on their website and uh, you know started teaching there a few months later, uh, and learned a ton there. I uh, stayed there for like th about three and a half years, and then uh, started my own school. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. From law to uh, to software engineering, then to teaching. That's amazing. So the book was how to be a better teacher, right? No, it was uh, the book I was reading was called um, Teach Like a Champion. Teach Like a Champion. I should check it out. What does it talk about? So the main takeaway I got from it. So one is this for like, um, like high school, middle school teachers, right? Uh, so a lot of it is just and if you if you like I volunteered in a high school, so you just see how much time can be wasted because the class room time is only like 45 minutes long. So literally, if you spend like 10 minutes getting people settled and then like handing out the assignment, then you have like 30 minutes to teach a lesson. It's crazy. Um, but the main takeaway I got from that class was just feedback. You know, always try to be getting feedback from your students to see what are they actually learning um, and assessing that constantly, right? So they would just give like different mechanisms as to how to do that. Um, and that's what I started working in to the classroom and also what they did at Flatiron School. Interesting. I should check it out. So getting feedback is the main takeaway, right? 
Yeah, there is actually there's like an article written by Malcolm Gladwell uh, on teaching as well and educators. And that's basically the way because they're saying, like, how do you evaluate teachers? And that's like the main way that they evaluate teachers. And one thing I'd say is, like, you'd be surprised how, you know, like you could do an awesome job teaching a subject, but that does not mean the students understand it. And I think teachers are often surprised, like, and, and I'll watch on like lectures, you know, given by like these great Stanford professors and things like that. And then I'll see them give the quiz. And I'm just surprised that, okay, the students did not retain this information because, you know, they're either doing other stuff or there's so much to focus on or et cetera. But you're just always surprised when you go to assess student learning that it takes a few times for them for it to sink in. It's always the case, right? No matter how good uh, the teachers is. Well, the other thing is, you know, the best, it's like, you know, passive learning versus active learning. So if you're giving, like one thing from another book they said is, like, if you're the one doing all the work, you're the one, uh, you know, look at who's making the noise in the classroom. If it's the teacher, he's the one having fun, he's the one learning. If it's the student, like, they're the one having fun and they're the ones learning. So, like, you can tell where the learning's going on just by who's the one, who's the uh, group of people being active. So you were a software engineer, right? So you were uh, doing development job, and then you accidentally bumped into this book and decided to become an instructor. Or how did you? How did this happen? Why did you decide to actually leave your software engineering job and become a teacher? Uh, so I was interested in education since I was about like 20 years old. Uh, I, you know, I did like a lot of human rights stuff uh, in undergrad, and. Then I, you know, so I did this like really cool, uh, like summer program, uh, like working with refugees and got, got really into it when I was like 20. And then I tried to then like, I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to kind of keep going with that in college. So I was like looking for just projects to help out similar types of groups. Um, and one thing I kept on hearing from people is like, hey, can we donate this stuff to them? Or can we do this type of thing? And they're like, all right, well, you can, like, they need a cleaner water. So it's like, okay, well, you can like, yeah, you can like give them water filters. Uh, but unless there's like training to go along with it, they're not going, you know, they're not going to really know how to use it. And then it was, and they said, and by the way, like instead of water filters, they could just boil their water. And if they have, you know, if you train them like kind of like these sanitary things, then they actually don't need to, they, they don't need these services in the first place. So we kept on kind of running into like education as a solution. And for me, it really came like from that element. And then, you know, just reading about it, it involves so many different skill sets that that's, it, it was just like a great challenge that you could go in a lot of different directions with it and go very deep with it as well. So, it, it, so it's like, instead of bringing people fish, teach them how to fish. Yeah, but it's also, you know, without, you know, people always say it's like, you know, you can have it build unless the technology is really perfect, right? It's like the last mile problem. Like, okay, well, then you hand it over to the people. Are they, are they actually using it, right? And, you know, so that's, you know, when I went there too, they were basically asking for education. Like they they needed work and they, for them, it, they were refugees. For, so for them, they didn't speak English. So it's like English training. You know, so in college, I was like trying to develop like an online program to help them learn English and things like that. So I just kept on running into education as something that was it seemed like a good solution. And it also was fun to do. Yeah. So then you checked the so you were studying there at Flatrion or you said you studied at General Assembly. So this was. Yeah. So I did. So, you know, when I was a lawyer, like at that point, I really wanted to learn how to code. Right. I just worked in this startup. I saw, you know, it was like 10 people doing this like amazing stuff. It was it blew me away. And so when I was a lawyer, like I was just itching to try to figure out how to code. At that point, it was 2013. There really were like hack, uh, the the only like boot camp for months that I could see. Um, right now they're called Recurse Center, I think. Uh, but at the time, uh, they had a different name. Um, so anyway, but they were they were more like a writers retreat, uh, like for coders, you know, for people that really could code. And then Flatter and School and General Assembly were really like the first two uh, coding boot camps in New York City that you could get into. I didn't get into Flatiron School, uh, so or I, I think they you know, they were filled up, so I went to General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were looking for a teaching job, so you went to Flatiron website, uh, the careers page, right, and you saw was it lead instructor, but yeah, then you worked yeah, there like, as a lead teacher, right? And, 
And I think your last position there, if I remember correctly, is lead curriculum writer. So what, what does it mean to be a lead so curriculum my, writer? So essentially, you know, my last role was really to like build the data science uh, course, right? Um, because at that point they offered the web development course and they had just been bought by WeWork and they wanted to develop, you know, both expand the school in terms of locations and then also, you know, product offerings. Uh, and I wanted to, be like, I was really interested in data science. So, you know, I kept on asking them even before that if we could build a course in that. Um, so, you know, it basically involved just, you know, first pitching to, uh, you know, like leadership that, hey, this, this was, this would work both in terms of employers would hire these students and the fact that like students would want to apply for that. So it was a lot of just like competitor analysis, looking at the job market, looking at, you know, was there a viable career path, um, looking at like student interest, things like that. Um, and then it was, okay, looking also at other schools to see how did they develop a curriculum, what subjects they teach, what would it mean for us to do something like that, talking to employers to get feedback from them, talking to past students from these other schools, and then just getting started writing curriculum. Uh, and then, you know, about like six months in, we hired a team of curriculum writers uh, to help out. So this is what you did as a lead curriculum writer, right? I guess so. I mean, like, you know, but you, this wasn't your titles. So as you said, you were, yeah, I guess that's you right. were like, teaching web development, title. right? Right. I but mean, my you... title didn't really, you know, like, I don't know. Like I also then taught the course, like taught the first course while I was still the lead curriculum writer. <laughs> okay. But what does it actually mean to build a curriculum? To be a lead curriculum writer? It means you write, yeah. you know, you write curriculum. Yeah. Uh, but what, I, what I does it mean know. to write a curriculum? What does it mean to build a curriculum? Well, what do you do there? So what does... What the curriculum actually is? What is that? Oh, like okay, so um, you know, like first you basically write out like the syllabus, and, and you try, you know, so you, for, like first I guess I like read, you know, did all like just got a bunch of ideas, and by looking at other people's syllabuses and topics and reading blog posts on the school experience and things like that, right? And then from there you start it's to like general like, level topics, right? Uh, I don't know, yeah, data like, science could be regression, classification, clustering, right. time series, whatever. Exactly. Right. And then, you know, looking at Coursera courses, looking at statistics courses, look, you know, you, you kind of start with, okay, here's the topics we need to teach. And then what does that, what does that mean? And then you, you know, so you go deep into these individual courses that are all kind of disparate. Um, and then you start to see like how they line up, right? Because you always want the learning material to fold into one another. Like if it, if it, um, if you just teach it once, and it's never used again. Was your brain learns that, and they they'll ne you forget it immediately. So you want to see like, okay, how do these topics build on one another? Um, and then you want to you know develop a syllabus uh, where that lines up. And then finally, you start writing the curriculum. Like you just start literally you know typing on the page and coding out. And uh, you know I started with the intro material and and just started writing that curriculum. And then as you're doing it, things change, right? And especially as you then go to teach. The material you you know things change as well you see just the ordering changes or you need more time here and not as much time there and things like that so the curriculum is a detailed detailed uh, description of each unit or model no or i mean it, it's it's a syllabus but then also it's you know liter you know readings right so you have to write out like lessons for every uh corresponding like lecture that you give so each lecture Say if a lecture is an hour, that probably consists of like three different lessons, two to three different lessons, and then probably two different, two to three different labs, right? So you'll give maybe like two different small labs and then one larger lab uh, to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. So it could be like, okay, we take a, like an instruction, a step-by-step -step, step instruction of what exactly you're going to talk about. So for example, if we take, I don't know, regression, so first you show a data set, then you talk about, I don't know, importing scikit-learn, then you talk about turning this data set into something, then you said there is a lab, so students actually sit and do that, and then there is another bunch of, uh, you know, you talking about something that students do, and you describe all that on a piece of uh, paper or in a Google. Yeah, yeah, but you, you break it down. Like, I think, you know, you break it down very granularly, right? So like, I think with regression, it would be like, because you want to understand 
each component, right, of y equals mx plus b, or whatever, right? So you start with, okay, well, this is b, and this is like y, because that's the most simple probably to understand, and it just like raises the line up and down. And then m, of course, is the slope. And then from there, you probably be like, hey, by the way, we can like build this and plot this out in code. Uh, and as we change these numbers, like as we change m and b, you can see this thing change. So you you want them to like understand it, each component concept conceptually. And then from there, you'd probably want to do, okay, like why, you know, you, you want to really understand the application of it. And honestly, probably like ideally, you want to understand the application first and then go into uh, the underlying components. Mm -hmm. Did you already know about data engineering back then that you want to teach it uh, when you were? Uh, I had no idea. No, <laughs> no, uh, no. I mean, when I was teaching data science, I'd say one thing I saw was, you know, because I had been teaching web development at that point for a couple of years. One thing I kept seeing and like kind of like wasn't, you know, kept on kind of saying to myself and to some others was like, man, if they knew they're better at engineering. Like they would just be so much better at these projects and these skills and like you could just see like how much it made sense uh and how much you know the, the reason why i was able to teach myself like sk learn and pytorch and things like that pretty quickly was because i was a software developer um you know i could read libraries pretty well and understand what was going on um so that's what i kept seeing that and kept trying to like advocating for more and more uh back-end development work uh, and, and, you know, when I first launched my school, it was data science as well. And really what was the turning point was just the job market shifted uh, so that it, I felt like it was no longer viable career path for someone to go, just go through a coding boot camp and become a data scientist, but it was a viable career path to become a data engineer. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's uh, go a little bit back. So at some point you decided to leave Flutteron and start your own uh, bootcamp. So why why did you make this decision? You know, you could I have guess... just followed the same approach, right? You could have pitched this to um, to the school, right? And go. Well, I, I didn't know that data engineering. I left Flutteron ah. school before I kind of yeah, moved, right. you know. But when we when I first taught a Flutteron school. This was, I think the first course graduated in like 2018, then 2019. Uh, like students got jobs as data scientists pretty, pretty quickly. E even though, you know, the course probably still had some more, like a lot of improvement, uh, but the job market was such that that was okay. You know, they were, they were getting great career paths out of it. So that was really cool. Um, so, you know, in terms of leaving Flatiron School, I guess, there was a, there are other components that I wanted to do uh, beyond just build curriculum. You know, there are other things that like problems I wanted to solve. So one thing was like career services. You know, like I, I felt like there was a huge opportunity like in career services to just stick with the students because lots of times what I saw was okay, students would be like at this level, uh, like like maybe right at the bar to get a job when they graduate, and then there was a huge difference between students that kind of just had a good path going forward and those that were kind of floundering right uh so you know that was you know i would see it because then we would check in on students that didn't get a job three to four months later it was like oh crap they forgot you know so much of what we had been teaching them so like so that was one thing uh i thought the school could be way way cheaper you know by by making a part-time by just like lowering the tuition uh, things like that. And then, you know, I, I think like for me, I also had this question of, okay, like, why doesn't everyone do this? You know, and I didn't feel like anyone had a good answer for that. Uh, so that I think when I like left the school, it was things like that too. I was like, I want to answer those kinds of questions that don't have to do with curriculum. And like, I'm not like, I, right now I'm a teacher, you know, and, and I, and I write curriculum. So to do that, this is now starting to be my own school. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to uh, focus to lower the price. You wanted to do it part time for those who already that work. That was really a dramatic thing. Yeah. You know, that was part of the why doesn't everybody do this type component was like, you know, when you join a boot camp, it's always take the leap and, and trust, right? And, and it's a boot camp, right? And which means it's like all encompassing type of thing. And I wanted it to be something where you don't have to like put your whole career on the line to do this thing. Right, um, you know, like like it doesn't have to feel like one. I went through boot camp, and I know that it feels very vulnerable when you quit your job and then you're just 
put in so much trust in a school to really deliver. Like you have no other option. Like at that point you are in their hands, you know? And like, if you, if you don't quit your job, well then all of a sudden that's not true at all. You know what I mean? Like, like if you, if the school doesn't work out or you don't like it, you can literally, you can just walk away effectively. Um, and, and it's not a huge deal. Uh, but if, or, you know, but if something happens, you get six, so there's some sort of tragedy or whatever, like, yeah, that's pretty dramatic when you quit your job and you're trying to transform your career in four months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you saw that and you thought, okay, I should make a, create my own school for, for people who will do it part-time. Right. And I guess But it's it also out. like, it was also don't, you know, lower the barrier to entry. Like, how do you lower the barrier to entry to make this possible? Like, like what it was, you know, really like the, the first question was again, like, why doesn't, why don't more people do this? Right. So, you know, one thing I started doing was I started just teaching weekly workshops right after work. Because like, okay, that's like a natural step to just showing people they can do it. It's not a huge commitment. Right. And then you know, instead of showing up once a week, show up three times, you know, obviously it's a more commitment, but hopefully you see that, hey, this is, coding is, is more fun than you might think. And you can, it is, it's, it does not involve math and it's different than you might think, right? Like the misconceptions around coding from people who have never coded before, it's probably, it's pretty dramatic. They were for me. Uh, so it was a lot of that. Like, how do you introduce this to people? How do you not make it such a huge step and and make it an easier transition for people mm -hmm. yeah interesting but you started first with machine learning for your own bootcamp machine mm -hmm. learning data science all that but then you gradually shifted to data engineering why did you do that yeah it was all about jobs like job opportunities i mean i was i was very surprised like i said you know when we when i first started teaching data science like there was you know, we, we follow, we like went on people's LinkedIn that went to different boot camps and like made sure there was like a, a real career path. And same thing, like the students that I taught initially, like they kind of got, they, they got made the leap and they got to become data scientists. And some of them are doing some really amazing things now. Um, by the time I, my, in my first data science class that I was teaching, I started talking to employers And, you know, telling them, you know, what my students were doing and things like that. And they're like, they're like, well, you're like, okay, that's still not, we're st we still wouldn't be that interested, you know, um, and they still need more and they're still not actually great. Do you know how many applications we get for this position is crazy. Like, I don't even know I'm talking to you. And I'll be like, okay. How many do you remember? Well, I remember, I mean, there'd be, you could click on like this stuff. And it would, so many of the jobs would say like over 500, you know, mm -hmm. um, You like one person I, I spoke to a data scientist at BCG who was who told me, you know, I get 20 pings on LinkedIn a day uh, asking me, how do I become a data scientist? Like the only reason I'm talking to you is because, you know, you seem interesting and you have this school, uh, you know, like you can read like Vicky Boykus's blog and she'll just, you know, it's like she, you know, she wrote, uh, right. She wrote that blog post, like data science is different now. And she talks about just so, yeah, so many people in, And one of the things I, you know, to point out is just, but you know, I would be like, yeah, but my students are really good. And they were, I'd be like, these students are really good, but it doesn't matter if there's just so much noise, you know, like flooding the market. It's just not worth the time. Like, I think the reason why people are looking for masters and PhDs is just like a easy way to like cut out a bit of the applicant pool, you know, and, and just like for mental sanity purposes, be like, all right, I'm just going to look at these people. And then data engineering, on the other hand, was in demand, but did not yeah. receive such a lot of attention like data science, right? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, you know, you actually had engineering skills. Like, like if you graduate with, you know, working in data engineering, you know, with data science, there's so much to learn, too. That was the other thing. Was It, it was hard to build a curriculum around it. We kept, I kept extending the course. It was originally six months. And then I was like, okay, well, we should teach you AWS, Docker, and like, you know, others, Airflow as well. So then, you know, it kept on, and kept on extending it to the point that it was like eight, nine months. With data engineering, it was like a more defined skill set of, you know, Python, SQL, cloud computing, you know, or orchestration, uh, things like that. Uh, and they, and you could go deep into those subjects so that you weren't, you know, just going an inch deep in, you know, 15 different subjects. You're focusing, you know, on really giving them solid Python SQL skills. It's like turn them into a backend developer and then also add this kind of data specialization on top. Mm -hmm. 
Did you also see that some of your students who um, went through your data science bootcamp that they were getting jobs as data engineers or not really? No, we were able to get them, but you know, there were qualified students like they, you know, P, like, like PhD students and people that had been working with SQL or things like that for you know five plus years. Um, so, you know, it was, it was successful, but I did see that, uh, but I, I didn't think it was sustainable. Like I, I thought it was still too much lift, right. To get them. I was like, this was way too much work. Like we had them do everything. Like they did, they like, crush Kaggle competitions like they like before they graduated like they did so much stuff and I just was surprised at the resistance um but then when I was I did talk to graduates from other boot camps and was in our view because I was wondering like are, are they able to get data science jobs you know like like how does this work and and then and when I called these you know these students and spoke to them I was like no it was like either they would get kind of engineering jobs or data engineering jobs or analyst positions, but I felt like that door had closed. Mm. Interesting. I talked to a data science bootcamp here in Berlin and they said something similar. So many students that graduate from data science bootcamp that they have uh, end up uh, being hired as data analysts. So, and right. they now are uh, kind of very purpose in this or are they thinking like building a new curriculum for data analysts and uh, because this yeah, is how data scientists are usually hired the data scientists that graduate from that bootcamp yeah i mean I'm, i even wonder like how much like i i trust a person hiring for machine learning more than data science to begin with like because data science is there really i feel like there's a big diversity in the skill set asked uh, machine learning i think at least there's like it's becoming more consolidated as a skill set being asked for. It's just pretty advanced. Like I think you need kind of like the data engineering skill set plus like plus than the machine learning skill set. Mm -hmm. And how how do you make sure? So you have uh, students who go through your your bootcamp, data engineers. So how do you make sure they get hired? Yeah, I mean we do a lot. I mean one crucial thing is honestly the admissions, you know, just only admitting people that we believe are going to get hired at the end of it. Like that's the main question I ask myself. Uh it's hard to do, you know, it's hard to do because one like you know, you like these, you know, you like the applicants and you want to say yes uh to people. And then obviously you want to grow the school. Um so, but but only doing that that's I think that's like a huge thing. Um, two, you know, the curriculum, we just try to have it line up perfectly with what employers are looking for. And then three, you know, we, we do, we do the post-career, uh, work. So we meet with them twice weekly, uh, to make sure that they're on track. Um, and, and that also gives us feedback on the curriculum, right? Cause I see what questions are being answered. I see, you know, how they're applying for jobs, like things like that. And then finally, like, hopefully like the other thing we saw in the first data, data engineering course was we paired students up after they graduated with employers, uh, like working for free. Because this way, you know, if it takes a few months to find a job, they're building experience. And that was that was really successful. Uh, and so we built that into this program that like halfway through, you'll start working for a company for free. And that way you'll have experience by the time you graduate. Ah, interesting. How, how does that actually work? Like do companies agree? Because I sometimes uh, some random people write me on LinkedIn, hey, I will work for free, give me a job. And then mm -hmm. I'm, okay, but how do I <laughs> even do that? Like it's exactly. easier to say. And then like another thing is if, pers if a person is working for free, I do not trust the motivation of this person. They exactly. might just decide one day not to show up because why would they? Uh, so like I'm, I have very mixed feelings. And then another uh, another thing here is like, why for free like can't they just pay i don't know like minimum wage for that as well mm -hmm. yeah um so there's a couple things that we saw too it was like you know if, if students just ask for an internship it's still an investment on the side of the company right to you know they're allocated like the most expensive thing is still going to be like a senior engineer's time mm -hmm. to make sure and do project management and things like that so that's why we kind of said okay we'll help you right with coaching the students and kind of be the manager for the students, right? So it's like they kind of deliver a good amount of stuff for us. Um, the other thing is, you know, we try to, we basically say, hey, try find find projects that are not mission critical, but are nice to have. And, you know, we'll really provide value. And if they're delivered, you'll, you know, you'll use them, right? Um, 
And then, you know, we, we allocate in class time, right? This is, we allocate six hours per week and we kind of make sure students tell us in advance if they're going, if they're available for additional hours and that they stick to that, right? So kind of like as a teacher, we, we provide a lot of, you know, hey, this is what you signed up for. You know, we have to deliver, we have to be engaged on it. And the same thing, like the admissions really helps. Like our students are real, you know, professionals and they're, they're quite good. Um, so they, they provide that prof professionalism when they do the job. Hmm. So when you do this screening, what kind of signals you look for? So, I mean, technically, like technical skills, we look for just like, you so know, one, what we just we need to be able to program when Yeah. Yeah. So we, like we give them for engineers, right? Already. Say that again. It's like already for engineers, let's say somebody is working in uh, software engineering already. This is for them or they are not? No, no. I mean, we, we have taken people like I say some of our students, maybe about a third to 20 percent um, have had previous like engineering experience or have uh, like gone to other boot camps, things like that. But what that but by the way, like sometimes I mean, you can't trust like we've had people that have been like CTOs, uh, but, you know, for different organizations, but that doesn't necessarily validate their coding uh, background or skill set. Um, so we have to, we always do like a technical interview. Um, so for us, what we do is we give them, uh, there's like free curriculum that we have on the website, uh, like intro to coding, right? Uh, intro, starting from zero to whatever on, on Python. And we say, hey, go, go do the first 10 lessons and then we'll give you an assessment. And that's what I'm, when I'm, when we're doing the assessment, uh, what I do is, you know, I both, you know, like I, I'm looking to see, like, do they understand each step? Like they're not memorizing anything, but they can tell me why, you know, they're using each step. Um, and then like, can, if I give them something a little bit off the track of what they learned in the curriculum, can they respond to my teaching style and, and understand this? So you're looking to see like, can they, are they thinking? Right. Like, and are they thinking it was just hard to do when you're under pressure. Right. And then translating those thoughts into code. Right. If they can do that, uh, that's pretty good. Like, 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 it's, you know, if they've only if they spent a couple of weeks and, and they were able to do that, that's pretty good. And you also pick up a lot of things like, all right, well, they are they going to put in the work? Are they motivated to put in the work? Um, you know, those components. And then you've already spoken. I've already spoken to them at this point. So in the earlier stage, we see, okay, what are they looking to get out of this program? What do they kind of know about the industry? Uh, what's their previous background that, you know, employers might look for or find attractive when they then go to hire them, right? So there are things like that that we're also looking at. And I uh, have a question that uh, is quite relevant to what we are talking about is how does one know then the students are ready to apply for an entry level data engineering role? And maybe I will rephrase it a little bit because it's similar to a question I wanted to ask, which is about uh, what do you include in the program? No, I think they are similar because you probably know what entry level data engineers should know. So you put these things specifically in the curriculum, right? Yeah. And, uh, am I correct that this is how you know that they are ready because you include uh, only the things that yeah, but uh, they need to. Yeah, I mean, we can put in the curriculum, but it goes back to the same thing. Like uh -huh. they need to master and really understand that material. And, and not only that, it's six months worth, you know, it's 400 plus hours of material over six months. Uh, so like though they trust when they graduate, they a lot of them, I'll say, hey, apply, uh, start applying for jobs, even if you're not ready. Right, start applying. It's cool. Get get those rejections out of the way, uh, and that's a good motivating factor. And we start to see, you know, and so we do that. Their thing is, we'll we'll ask that we'll give them technical interview questions, right, uh, and see how they perform in that. But there's no um, no harm in, in applying to the job, especially when they're starting to get, you know, takers and, and people that accept them. Which generally, when you have those skill sets. That, that's a nice thing is they don't have too many problems getting interviews. Uh, so I encourage them to get the interviews, get scared, you know, bomb an interview. Uh, and then, you know, we can use that and you'll, they'll be motivated uh, to improve. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is they might not be ready, but they just need to get over this fear of rejection. And it's then like, eventually, yeah, I mean, interviewing is a skill in itself. You know what I mean? Like, 
like, you know, it'd be great. Like, you know, you see all the time on LinkedIn, how the technical interview does not line up to the job. Of course, we like, we all know that. Uh, so being great at interviewing is itself a skill, no matter, really probably no matter what job you're applying for. So I, I want them to start doing that and it will start to kind of like put them on track as well as, okay, they bombed the interview. Now they really want to start practicing lead code. You know, like now they see like, oh crap, like I really need to improve my, I thought I was good at SQL, but now I really got to improve it even more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but technically from what I understood from you, the students are already ready technically, but they just need to learn how to pass the interview. What kind of questions get asked, how to answer these questions. And these questions are not always technical. So from my experience, like maybe 50% of the interview, is not super technical. They're like, okay, tell me about yourself. Tell me about the yeah. project that you're proud of. I don't know. Tell me about X, Y, Z. And then you need to have some practice, right? To to know how to answer these questions. And the only yeah. way you can learn is, I guess, uh, you know, going to interviews. Well, that's true. But I, it really helps. I think it really helps to talk to an engineer about your experience. Like you have a friend that's an engineer. So what I'll do is, you know, before students go on interviews. I, like I have every student send me their resume. I look through their resume, but then I talk to them for like 30, 40 minutes about their job experience. And I'd say like, inevitably I'll be like, I'll be like, Oh, I didn't get any of that from your resume. Uh, ew, that would be super attractive to an employer. Like, let's, let's put that in there. And that process is basically like now how you, you know, what we put on the resume is now a lot like focuses what you want to talk about in the interview. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what do you actually put on the curriculum? What are the topics there? I mean, so uh, the first section, we think of it like analytics engineering, right? So it's Python, you know, strong focus on SQL, uh, and then building kind of an analytics engineering pipeline. Uh, so Fivetran, DBT, um, Snowflake, uh, and then we use Mode as like a business intelligence tool. Um, so that's, that's like the first section. And then the second section is essentially backend engineering. So it's, you know, Flask, uh, building ORMs, uh, like the adapter pattern, you know, ETL and Python, um, MVC, obviously. Uh, and, the, you know, so, the, and that takes a while, like to go through that and it, it, a lot in testing, right? So a lot of that is like, how do you write code for a larger code base? How do you navigate a larger code base? Um, things like that. And, and, and that's, that's another, I don't know, 10, 10 weeks or so. And then finally we go into cloud computing and airflow. Uh, so Docker, AWS, um, airflow. And then and we layer in like starting in that second semester, one, they start their externship, like their internships, right? We do that six hours per week. And then also we start layering in interview questions. So they start kind of thinking that way. Do, do you cover things like, I'm. Uh, making uh, some comparisons, by making parallels with the course we have, Data Engineering Zoom comes. Sure. And uh, yeah, so we do not, for, we have this the analytics engineering module. Uh, we don't really talk about uh, Fivetran. We, we cover just DBT, but we do cover things like Spark and Kafka, which you do not right. cover, right? We do not cover that. So we taught Spark uh, in the first iteration. And you know, I have we have so we have curriculum on that, but we saw what wasn't really asked in interviews, uh, wasn't really required of junior. I, like I see it a lot for senior engineering positions. You know, I scraped we scraped all these data engineering positions. It does come up a lot, but when we, uh, I want to look deeper to see if it's even listed on junior data engineering positions, like zero to three years experience. Um, and then it wasn't asked in interviews, right? So so that's why we. You know, we're like, okay, we have other things to teach. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Kafka, I guess. I remember when we first met; it was a couple of years ago, and I think you were showing me some a uh, curriculum, and you were asking my feedback on that curriculum. And I think we talked about Kafka at some point, right? Mm -hmm. You wanted to include this, but at the end, I, just, I guess you decided to drop it. Was it uh, again the same thing as with Spark? Yeah, it was the same thing. You know, like I don't, I don't think it's listed that it's listed for again like more senior level position. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, you know, like this analytics engineering role really has like grown in the past couple of years. So we wanted to, you know, focus also put time into that. But the truth is, like we took out, we started taking out like 
Like we used to teach Kubernetes too. And then we saw while it like turned heads, like people were impressed that the students knew it. Uh, and, and sometimes they would ask questions on it. It wasn't, it, you know, it, it took so long. It took like two and a half weeks to teach it, which is a good chunk of the course. And then it just wasn't enough value added to justify keeping it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember again our uh, discussion a couple of years ago, you said that there is no good book that covers machine learning and Kubernetes. And I thought, okay, I need to include this in my book. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> it's a complex topic, yeah. a very complex topic that yeah. I, I, I realized that it can be very overwhelming for people who are entering the field. You can teach it. Like, I, I really think, you know, you teach Docker first, obviously. And then, you know, you can, like, we were able to successfully teach Kubernetes. The other part of it that was not great was it's people are stopping, they stop coding. You know what I mean? Like, like Kubernetes, you're, you're writing YAML files. You're not, yeah. Yeah. you're not coding. And that's two and a half weeks that, that the students are not like, are, are not coding. So we kind of like, that was the other thing. We always wanted like reinforcing skill sets. So if you, if you look at the curriculum, it's all like 80, like I tell people that are applying, like, yeah, the curriculum is really like 85% Python and SQL. Like that's, that's really what we're teaching all the time. Mm -hmm. A question we have is what steps should a data analytics or BI professional take to become a data engineer? I think you we kind of partly covered that, right? So when you were describing the curriculum, uh, maybe they should start with analytics engineering, right? So what, what do you think about that? For analytics engineering or data engineering? Oh, like for data analysts, they want to become data engineers. So what sure. kind of steps they should take? Yeah, I'd say the main thing, you know, to ramp up on is backend engineering and cloud computing. I like cloud computing is probably the easier step to fill in the gaps with. And then, you know, Python. Uh, so maybe, you know, if you wanted to just start applying for jobs, maybe you start with cloud computing, but uh, like probably on the job, a lot of uh, what would be asked of you would be like Python. Uh, and I think you're seeing more and more people asking Python questions in, uh, in the interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, things like Fivetran, DBT? Should we yeah, go? Yeah, I mean, definitely. There? They're, they're easier to learn. You know, Fivetran you can learn in a day or so, less than that mm -hmm. probably, right? Like it's designed to be very easy to learn. Uh, DBT, you know, same type of thing. Like you can you can navigate DBT like well enough for interviews probably in, you know, uh, a week uh, or two. Like it's not so bad. What's harder is, and, and I don't know, you know, I think for on the job, like the pat like the dbt patterns and you should know that stuff of you know like staging and integration and marks um so like uh so le learning that stuff is valuable but i think if, if you can just start navigating dbt and then more like writing ctes and writing like modular sql code that's that that would be helpful what is cte a cte like you know, a common table expression so just wrapping oh, okay. right yeah yeah just, just wrapping the SQL statement with, you know, with us. You said you scraped um, a lot of job descriptions. Mm -hmm. and then you saw that Spark is not there for for junior positions, but it's present for seniors. I'm wondering uh, how often do you see Fivetran and uh, things like Airbyte, this low, you know, it's low surprising. code, but lower code. Things. I don't see the the analytics. So we didn't scrape. I didn't scrape specifically for analytics engineers uh, yet. But for data but, engineers. Well, it just it just did it for data engineers like literally in the past month. And I, I don't the the analytics engineering stack like does not show up at all. Like it shows up a little. Like I literally see like ten out of like four hundred uh, job descriptions are listing like DBT, which is kind of crazy. It, but even like the words ELT, like the words ETL, like show up at the very top. But then ELT is like nowhere to be found. Um, I think people which, just mean like they use them interchangeably. Like I, I always confuse. Oh, what is the difference? Uh, I'll just go with ETL. It doesn't matter. Right. I just mean. Uh, I just mean. I don't know. Data pipeline. Yeah, but you know, it's like when you look at the Slack channels, like then you'll see uh, DBT and and Airbyte and things like that listed, like in like yeah, kind of any of these Slack channels. But uh, I don't know on the job descriptions. I'm not sure if it's these are companies that aren't as plugged in, or if it's just the job description isn't lining up or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you but you still decide to teach it, right? Regardless of uh, whether because you I know there's a market for it. You know what I mean? Like okay. I know that I can we can reach out on these, you know, we can go to these Slack channels or th these employers and and they'd be attracted to people that really know DBT. And the same thing, like when I talk to employers, they're like, oh, do you have people that really know DBT? Like we'd love that. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll, cool. we'll, we'll make them. Mm -hmm. Another question is a uh, question from John. 
um, like for data engineering, SQL is a useful skill. So how uh, how to improve SQL uh, if somebody wants to do that? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you basically need to know SQL in and out. Uh, so like, you know, beyond, you know, aggregates, obviously, and joins, that's kind of level one. And then you want to know, uh, probably window functions is a mate, like a favorite of interview questions. Um, you know, the leak code problems really are like, you know, if you look at data engineering interviews, people will be like, I always ask this leak code question, you know, uh, and I always ask this leak code question. Like, so those leak code questions, if you can get to, you should probably be at like the medium level. Uh, but lead, by lead code questions, you mean, because I know on lead code you have uh, algorithmic challenges and SQL problems as well. You mean the... I, I mean the SQL. Just click on the SQL, SQL one. lead code okay. for SQL, right? And then be able to do probably up to like medium uh, for most positions is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really like, that's the main way they'll be assessing SQL. The other thing is going to be data modeling, like, you know, knowing the difference in modeling between like OLTP versus OLAP. Uh, so practice modeling, uh, you know, you could probably find them online as well, because that's that's definitely a fair game for people to ask. So how do you, do you know any useful resources for that? OLTP versus OLAP? Yeah, and to um, modeling. For data modeling? You know what's interesting? Someone told me, uh, like another teacher that runs a, ran a, I forget the name, Turing School, I think, or something like that. Uh, they said like REST is really good for teaching for data modeling because it's kind of, it's pretty similar principles. Uh, so there's like REST for mere mortals. And then of course, you know, like there's the Kimball book, but sometimes it's like a bit too much. Um, it's quite can, uh, formal, right? Yeah, it's like very work. Yeah, right. I feel like the first couple of chapters is like enough of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there are, I think that there is some stuff online uh, where you can do it. The other thing are like those classic databases, like the, right, like Microsoft has like the Northwinds database and things like those types of databases and see how they're modeled, like try to model them in advance. You can take any kind of uh, like domain, like an airport, right? It, it, like that's, I give my students that, okay, model an airport, like, like down, here's a ticket. Here's a ticket of an airport, uh, you know, that, for a flight. You, you do the modeling for it, right? And then, you know, and then you, you could show it to an engineer, or maybe there is, if you Google it online, maybe you know people already have an answer for it. Okay, yeah. So just think of something like I don't know, parking lot. But I think yeah, I think you want to like look at sample databases. Uh, also, maybe if you go to code bases that are online, like. Like for instance, uh, shoot, there, there are like some organizations, if you look at their like their open source repositories, then just like go to their models, you know, afterwards and, and look at and draw it out. Like even just drawing it out would probably be useful. But if beforehand you guess, you know, what is the relationship or how is this modeled? That would probably be really useful. So somebody with the nickname future DS engineer asks, when to stop learning and start, start attending interviews? This seems like a notion of topics and never ends and overwhelms sometimes. Yeah, so that's why I think like, you know, there's no harm in just attending an interview for just to just to do it just for the experience, right? So if you feel like, I'd say they're mainly going, if you, if you maybe we can give some expectation as to what probably is going to be asked in an interview. So like the first interview would be probably a screening interview. Like maybe they'll ask you, uh, you know, like a little bit about data engineering. Maybe they'll ask you like OLTP versus OLAP. Um, maybe they'll just ask you, have you built any data pipelines? And, you know, tell me about some of the tools you've used in data engineering, things like that. You don't need to know every one of them. Uh, but just like if you've, you know, they want to know that you've spent some time with this. Uh, and then the second interview is probably going to be a SQL question. So you can expect that. So, you know, I'd say, if you can do some of the medium uh, lead code problems, then okay, you should feel pretty good. And you don't have to get them 100% right. But if, if you don't feel blown away by like the medium uh, SQL questions, then you're probably pretty good. And then at that point, go on an interview, you know, like, like just like, it's fine. Like there will be more interviews that show up. So I'd say like go on the interview and that will help you a little bit see you know you can self-assess afterwards you can see where you are one thing i would say 
what one uh, caveat to that and one thing to be careful of is sometimes I'll see students go on an interview they'll like bs something kind of out of left field and of course they bomb it uh and they'll be like i gotta learn that thing like i gotta learn everything about that thing and then you come back to them two months later they're still just like learning everything about that thing and so like you want to stay on your learning path of okay i'm building like a data pipeline i'm improving my sql skills i'm going through some like python leak code problems right because those will also uh, be asked So there are still a couple of questions I want to ask. So, uh, um, and the question uh, I want to ask most, if somebody wants to start teaching software engineering or data engineering or data science, any topic, mm -hmm. what would you suggest to them? So let's say I am a data engineer already. I do not have experience in teaching. What should I do? Okay. So, I mean, the first thing is, okay, so think of a topic, I guess, that it's probably like beginner level, you know, uh, meaning meaning that one is something like a beginner can accomplish and two uh, would be interesting to a beginner. Like actually find like, and that itself will be a process. Like it took me multiple tries uh, to get there. And then I'd say, explain it to someone, like explain it to, like explain it to someone at the level that you want your audience to be just one person and, and walk them through it uh, and teach them it. And then sh see if they know it and then also kind of maybe hear their feedback on it. And that would be pretty good, actually. Like at, the, at that point, you're probably ready to deliver that to a meetup, um, you know, to like a, a small classroom, something like that. Uh, it, if you can do it in person, it's better because uh, one is easier actually in person than online. And then two, you get more feedback. Like the feedback is almost immediate. Like you can sense everything uh, when you're teaching in person uh, and you can see their, their faces and things like that, which sometimes online you can't. So if you can teach, like just give it a workshop in person, that would be great. And then do it again, you know, just give that workshop, same workshop to a different meetup and revise it, right? And that's like kind of the teaching process is, is then revise the workshop and think about it and change the order of stuff and, you know, do it again. How, how do you revise it? Is it based on the questions you get? Is it based like you you explain something and then you see that clearly everybody is lost, right? And then you see, okay, Last probably I should have explained something else first. Sometimes, uh, normally you can, normally it's, uh, sometimes it's the questions. Questions can be really good and give you like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, I can tell you, lots of times you want to get to the point like as fast as possible, you know, or show the benefit as fast as possible. This is one of the reasons why I said teaching online is harder is because online people can just like leave in a millisecond, you know, like you're boring for like five minutes while they're going on Netflix immediately. And if, and if you're not interesting within the first five minutes, like it's amazing to just see the people <laughs> drop out of the Zoom. Um, so, you know, I found it way like the, my one of my best lectures uh, in person, right. was like building a neural network from scratch, right. Like, lots of people showed up, they got a lot out of it. And then I delivered it online, but because there was such like a lead up until it, we got to the interesting stuff, like, there, you know, like over half the people left by the time we got there. Mm -hmm. So I just had to like totally flip the order of everything to make, to make it, it, it like told me a lot about, oh, if I can actually put this here and then we can start getting to the point way earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because uh, like if when people come to the classroom, uh, it's not so easy for them to leave, right? And then switch to Netflix because they are physically in that exactly room. Exactly right. They're physically there. They're like with people, you know, things like that. You can also give them activities to do. You can't really give them it. In Zoom sessions, it's a lot harder like for people to, once you tell them to do something, I found that's another point where people would just like, you know, uh, drop off. But in person, you know, it's great. You're just like, okay, and th then here's this activity, turn the person next to you and work on it with them, right? And mm -hmm. like, I love, you know, that stuff is great. Mm -hmm. And then you said, uh, yeah, pick something beginner level and then and explain it to somebody. How do I pick up this somebody? How do I select who to? Like, I mean, I taught my mom, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like really, like if you go on my website, it's like me teaching my mom how to code like in 10, in ten lessons. Uh, and really, really, and she would do the same you thing. You actually recorded that. What's that? You actually recorded that. Yeah, yeah, I recorded it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's on the it's on the website. So and people have signed. People are like, oh, I'm signing up because I saw you teach your mom the code. <laughs> um, 
So, <laughs> and she gave me great feedback because I, you know, this is somebody who one uh, has no background, right, in coding, like let alone email, uh, and two has zero interest in code. Like, you know, she's retired; she's not going to use this. So you know, like when I'm giving these lessons, you know, I'm going through lists and here's how you select from a list, you know, all that. And she's like, 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 why do I need to know that? You know, so everything, which is how, the, how you're supposed to teach, everything should be directly solving their problem, you know? So they want to learn it and you're, you're answering their question, right? And that's like how you, like that, that's like a good lesson. Mm -hmm. And all this time, oh, when you talk about the bootcamp, you say, we, we teach, but I think you're a one person company. Uh, right? More or less. Uh, no, I, I, I have a co-founder, but uh, okay. yeah, in terms of like the education, things like that, yeah, it's basically me. <laughs> so how, how difficult is it for you to, to run this? What are the main challenges? Um, I mean, you know, writing the curriculum was like a massive lift, like literally probably over 2,500 pages of curriculum, you know, in the past three years. So just cranking, you know, right, and that's where my law background really helps is I can just like write eight page essays, like they're nothing. Um, <laughs> and, and also, you know, the, the education. That's know, useful. Yeah, yeah, I found a use for it, thank God. So, uh, so you know, but I'm, I'm still just writing constantly, um, like really, really all the time uh, for such a long time. But I'd say that was, that's kind of another challenge, which hopefully I did properly, which was, you know, when people ask me what I did, like if someone just randomly met me, I'd say I'm a curriculum writer. Like that's all I did for basically like two and a half years was write curriculum and then teach the course 17 hours a week. Right. Um, and then now, you know, so so I'd say like a lot of time, like the one of the nice things about this business is that I've been able to focus on like one thing at a time. So before I started the course, it was, you know, marketing and giving these workshops and things like that. And then once the course starts for the next six, eight months, I'm just writing curriculum, right, uh, and doing that. And then when students graduate, then like right now, I'm focusing on getting them jobs and marketing the next class. That's that's it. Like I'm not writing curriculum right now, I'm doing those two things. So at least just having a couple things on my plate and not five different things on my plate at once is uh, makes it manageable. Mm -hmm. There are quite a few questions we have about the interviews. And I just want to mention that Jeff will come again to Data Talks Club and he will do a webinar about getting a data engineering job that will actually cover that, mostly the interviews and how you need to prepare for that. So I will, uh, apologies, but I will skip them because there are a few questions that are related to actually teaching. And one interesting one is, uh, so we learn latest technologies, but most companies go for, uh, so here it says tried and tested uh, technologies. Um, so they prefer, you know, traditional versus uh, new shiny tech. So what is your opinion on that? Should we teach the new stuff? Should we teach the old stuff? Should we somehow find balance? How, how do you do that? Well, I mean, you, you teach the fundamentals. Like, I, I mean, the, the traditional tech is like SQL and Python. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that sounds great. I, I, like, you know, like, because even if you're a junior engineer, uh, I'd say, you know, if you can improve your Python skills, like, that's awesome. Like, I, like my first year as a software engineer, uh, you know, the, per, the the other junior engineer next to me was just building like Tetris and pure Ruby. And that's what the senior developer advised him to do. Just build object oriented programming in Ruby. Like, that's it. Right. And he got a job at Apple, like, like within, like by the end of that year. So it seemed like good advice. So I, I think, yeah, you don't have to go super deep. And like writing good airflow code means that most of the code is in Python. Right. So uh, and is not relying on airflow. So like most of your skill set should be on like Python and SQL. And, you know, like I said, that's what 85% of our course is. And then only probably like 15% is these like shiny new technologies. But cloud computing, like you can feel safe learning Docker and AWS. Like I, I think that's a safe bet. There are enough companies that are interested in that. Mm -hmm. So if I want to teach data engineering, then I should teach SQL, Python, cloud computing, Docker, and that probably is the 20% that covers, uh, you know, this Pareto principle. It covers 80% of uh, the yeah. work. I mean, it depends who you're teaching it to. You know what I mean? Like, like you go to these Coursera courses mm -hmm. and they're good. Like they teach you these skills, but they're not going deep into Python and SQL, right? They assume that, I guess you already know that. 
But if you're taking someone who is, who is not an engineer or has not really worked with SQL that deeply before, okay, you need to ramp them up on that. Mm -hmm. Like intense, like that has to be the focus of the course. Okay. So it seems we are uh, out of time, but maybe you want to mention anything before we wrap up? Uh, sure. So, you know, we are accepting applications for a new course. We have uh, the next course is June 15th. Uh, it's been it's like it's going well. Like uh, so, everyone from our last cohort got a new job. Um, the minimum, like the minimum salary, was 100k, which for me, actually, I don't, you know, I want their salary just to be good. But I, I just mainly care that they are launching a new career. Um, and then this course uh, also went well. So you know, we just they just graduated a couple of weeks ago. But we had a student get a job and has been a data engineer for the past couple of months now. Uh, so he, he got employed before he graduated. Um, yeah. Oh, so you can go to jigsawlabs.io if you're interested. Yeah. I was going to ask that. How can they find it? So send me the links and then sure. if people want to find you and ask a question, what's the best way? Of doing this? Oh yeah. They can, uh, well, they can email me Jeff at jigsawlabs.io. They can also ping me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, just do Jeff Katz and type in Jigsaw. Um, yeah, and then uh, Alexi, if you can just save the questions about the interview stuff, I can make sure. Yes, I will. Them. I am going to send you these questions. They're about system design. They're about yeah, something else. So I definitely saw a question about the system design, testing pipelines, uh, mm, some other stuff. Yeah, there are some questions related to teaching, which sadly we could not cover, but I'll send you them as well so you have them great yeah thanks a lot uh, thanks man that's great <laughs> yeah and thanks everyone for uh joining us today for asking questions thanks jeff and uh, by the way when you look for jeff in linkedin there is another jeff cuts so be careful there is one in berlin so this is not the right jeff yeah. i made this mistake once so now i have two jeffs in my linkedin network <laughs> Funny. So i'm glad i accepted you <laughs> Yeah, he did. So he's my first um, connection. No, I mean, first level connection. Uh, and he's also in the data space. So that was very confusing for me. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, and um, have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, man. You too. Take care.